All right. Well, let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. I'm really glad to see and hopefully hear from all of you today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host, founder, and chief cat herder, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation about the future of education today. But first, let me introduce the forum, explain where it came from, what it does, and then I'll introduce this week's guest. Now, you should know that the forum is a discussion-based venue. This is all about conversation. We don't have a lot of presentations here. The idea is to have face-to-face -face or video face-to-face -face discussions about where education is headed. Now, this is a spin-off from an earlier project called the FTTE Report, and the Future uh, Trends in Technology and Education project is an ongoing research effort. It consists of a monthly trends analysis published with PDF, and that's been going on for almost a decade. It tracks about 86, 87 major trends reshaping education, trends from technology, but also from economics, demographics, policy, enrollment, and other areas as well. So if you haven't seen that, just go to ftte.us and download a few sample copies and subscribe if you like. Now, the forum and the FTT report are both part of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. And this is a multimedia, open, discussion-based project to try to get our best intelligence about the future of higher education. So that includes the forum that we're in right now. It includes the FTTE report. It also includes a blog. It includes a book club. It includes a lot of writing and more things to come. If you haven't seen it yet, just go to futureofeducation.us and check it out. Now, we can only do this work with the help of really key and very, very much supported supporters. And we're glad to see some of them here, and I want to thank them before we proceed. The first one I'd like to recognize is NYSERNet from New York State. This is a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities really get the most out of online networks. They do tremendous work, very innovative, very collaborative, and we're delighted for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig. Because as you can tell, Shindig makes available the technology we're using right now. So let me just take you through it so you can see how it works. Now, where I am and where this slide is just for a minute is called the stage. And it's called that because everybody involved in this video conference can see and hear everything that goes on up here. So when you join us, you can hear and see us and you can hear and see me right now. It's like the stage in an auditorium or in a big internal hall. Now, right below us, you can see dozens of people around you. You can see individual icons, either with a video feed or a static picture or a silhouette, each representing one person or several people in a specific login. And that's the audience. That's you. And if you'd like to talk to somebody else in the audience, one thing you can do is double-click on their icon. And if they want to talk to you, your two icons will click together like Legos, and you can have your own private audiovisual bubble, which is pretty neat. Uh, I said the forum is all about <clears throat> conversation and discussion. So let me show you three ways to, to conduct those kind of conversations. Look towards the bottom of the screen. You'll see below the participants form, you'll see a white bar running along it. And that has a few different tools you can use. So the leftmost edge, you should see a number. Right now it's 41, 42, uh, with a little people's heads on it. If you click that, up will pop two different boxes. The one on the left will be a kind of film strip view of everybody who's participating in this conversation. And you can just mouse over them to get a little bit more information about them. On the right is a chat box. And the chat box lets you communicate with the roughly 20 people who have come in around the same time as you. And people use the chat box traditionally for informal conversation, for sharing links to topics that have come up. It's a really good spot for as well for trying out ideas and for floating questions. So there's the chat box. Back to the white strip. Next to the little icon with now 44 people, you'll see a question mark with a circle around it. Click that, and up will pop a little box, which will let you type in a question or a comment. Now, this is good if your camera isn't working or you don't feel like you're in a good spot physically to be able to participate in video. You just type that in, and when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen so everyone can see it, and I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. Now, next to that little raised hand icon, or next to the question mark icon, you'll see a raised hand with a circle around it. And this is the most powerful tool there. That tells us, if you click on it, that you want to join us up here on stage. And it's really easy to do. If your camera and mic are working and you are in a spot where you can speak out loud without uh, being shouted at, you can click that and you can join us up here on stage. 
um, right now we can hold up to four people here at a time. So between myself and our guest this week, we can have two of you. Think of it as a kind of pop-up panel. We can have that going right away. So if you want to join us, please click that raised hand button. We'd love to have you up here on stage. It's actually easier to do than it is for me to describe. So those three buttons on that white strip are three different ways for you to have conversations here using Shindig technology. If you want to go beyond that, if you want to go out onto Twitter, just use the hashtag FTTE. And we already have some people who are tweeting back and forth. Hello to uh, Lear Lobo, for example, and hello to Vanessa, good friends of the program. So those are the ways you can communicate and share and discuss back and forth. We're really grateful to Shindig for making available the technology that lets it all happen. Now, I'd like to thank one other group, and that is our supporters on Patreon. Now, Patreon is a crowdfunding site like Kickstarter or GoFundMe. And in this case, it lets you support for as little as a dollar a month people making some project that you find valuable. And here, it's our work in the future of education. So if you look through this slide, you can see people like, you know, Laura Amherst, Chris Lott, Bob Johnson, Michael P. Henry, Matthew P. Henry, excuse me, um, Corey S., lots of great folks. In fact, more than 110 now. We're really grateful to them for all of their support. If you'd like to join them, just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander and please support us. So that's who supports the Future Trends Forum. That's how the technology works and that's where it came from. Now I want to cut to the chase and introduce this week's guest. I'm delighted to have Mark Prensky here. You may know Mark because he's a popular keynote speaker. He's a popular writer. He's also the fellow who coined the term digital native. He's a very innovative, very forward-looking speaker, very forward-looking thinker. And today he's here to describe a new project that's extraordinarily ambitious and fascinating, which he calls Civilization Level Change in Global Education. There's a lot to this. So let me bring the slide down and let me bring Mark up on stage so he can start describing it. And then you can start asking him questions. So let me just do this. Let me put him up. Let me bring this slide down. And Mark. Greetings, sir. Who showed up. I remember uh, somebody saying thanks for showing up, which is really important. Um, and so uh, I hope to, to dialogue with you and share with you and continue beyond this particular uh, forum. If you, my email is markprensky at gmail.com. I'd love to stay in touch with anybody who, whose ideas are stimulated by this. Excellent. Excellent. Well, welcome. I'm really glad you could make it. Where are you today? What's that beautiful? I am in Woodland Palo Alto, Cabinetry? California. Um, I think it's sunny Palo Alto, California today, although it's been raining here. Uh, I moved from having lived my whole life in New York City, uh, mid-Manhattan, to Palo Alto mm -hmm. four years ago. And uh, it's very different, and I'm very glad I did. And it's a, it's a lovely place for anybody to spend time in. Well, we'll have to visit you when we get back. To and in time. fact, let me let me just get, add one thing that one of my good friends, when I moved, he said to me, ah, you moved from the can't do coast to the can do coast. <laughs> and that's not as that totally true as he thought, but uh, but it's uh, an interesting perspective. That is, that is. The sense of California is a land of possibility. Well, Mark, I, I introduced you with just a couple of notes and remarks. And I'm wondering if you could um, say a bit more about yourself by looking ahead to the rest of 2019 and tell people, what are you going to be working on? What's going to take up most of your time and what are you thinking the most about? Uh, nothing much. I'm, you know, like everybody else, trying to uh, improve the world. Um, oh, the, that's, it. that's it. You know, I really have been th I'm thinking about and working on uh, how education needs to change for the coming civilization that our kids are going to live in. And that's really the big, uh, the big thinking that I'm doing, not just by incrementally extending what we do, which is the way almost everybody seems to look at it, but by, by saying, going back to first principles and saying, what do we need? If we didn't have any mm. education and mm. we had the kids and we had the future that we have and we had the kids we have, what, would we do to prepare them to be uh, successful and happy and and living in that future? 
So that's, and, and I'm typically in the business. I see myself after all these years as being in the business of changing minds and helping people change their perspective. I'm kind of in your observatory metaphor. I'm like mm -hmm. a pulsar out there, you know, blinking, <laughs> trying to get attention, uh, nice. which I do some of the time. And this is, this is really nice. So um, I have thought about the, what education needs to be in the context of, as you all know, a very quickly exponentially changing world and kids who are increasingly more empowered by the technology and not only by the technology, but by the society in which they live. So that's really what I'm thinking. Uh, I thought I would show just two quick slides and I know that's not something that you uh, encourage, but this will allow you to at least get a, a view of what I'm gonna say. And then if you want these slides or you wanna use them or you wanna think about them, you can. So there's one called the new paradigm requires. Do you have that yeah. one available yeah. or, or Tara? Um, no, I've got I it right now. Happening here. Oh, there's, uh, there's movement. Uh, How's that? I have written extensively about a, a change in, there it is, so a change in paradigm. And I went back to Thomas Kuhn and I read and, and I reread mm. him. And his perspective is that changing paradigm is really putting on new lenses on the world, is really seeing the world from a very different perspective. So this summary is some of the ways that I think we need to really begin looking at the world in order to move our kids forward. And my whole uh, goal in this thing is to help the kids move forward. So the first one is learning and achieving to accomplishing. And I distinguish between achieving, which is for you, and accomplishing, which is for other people in the world, getting mm. things done. Mm. And I think we have overemphasized learning because learning, we all do it. We can't avoid it, but it's not a goal. It is for academics, but in general, it's not a goal. I think it's a byproduct. You do stuff that you want to do that gets you to the goals you want to reach, and you can't help but learning along the way that you can then apply to reaching new goals. And therefore, it's not just about bettering yourself, it's about bettering the world. And that's really a big change, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we used to do that indirectly. Now we can do it much more directly. Nice. Uh, so instead of saying we, we go to school to get empowered to learn, and I love, you know what the abbreviation for love of learning is? Think about it. Yeah, laugh out loud. There. You know, it's not everybody who, who loves learning, but almost everybody loves realizing their dreams and accomplishing the kinds of things that they want to do. So it's really a move to action. And that's something that was in our history for for thousands of years, that's really what education was. Somebody showed you how to do something and you invented ways. And then at some point the thinkers took over and they formed academies and that's all well and good. I have no uh, problem with thinking. I do as much of it as I can. But <laughs> what happened was that the academic view of the world, which is only thinking and not doing, somehow hijacked our K-12 education. So that not just doing, but accomplishing has totally been up till now banished. And what I'm seeing, the real paradigm I'm seeing is that it's coming back. And it's coming back because the kids are empowered and they're impatient with just sitting in a class and learning. As my kid said, we can do, we can do more than just sit in a class and learn for 18 years. Which means that it's not just your passion that we want to encourage, and we do want to help everybody find their own passion and skills and dreams, but applying that, applying that to making the world, their world, a better place. Uh, which means that the, the grades of today and the past are less important than people getting things done. And that's what Google says on its website, or it used to, we are looking for people who can get things done. And we don't care about where you went to college or your GPA, you know, just be able to get the kinds of things that we need done. So in that respect, it's not so much about thinking like scholars. And again, I, I have great respect for scholars, 
but there are just we just don't need that many of them. There are just mm. a few people we need. The Meisters of the of uh, Game of Thrones, you know, those were a, a small group of people that does think that can advise others. But most of the people in the world are not going to be that. They're going to be people who of action in one form or another. So doing in the real world. And finally, one of the great frustrations is when I talk to educators and they say, oh, you know, half the jobs of the future haven't been invented yet. And we don't really know what's coming. And we don't really know. And the, the truth is we know part of what's coming and we don't know all of what's coming, but we'd better be prepared for anything. And mm -hmm. so I like that attitude much more uh, for the kids. And then um, the, the other slide, if we can put that up. Yeah. Um, and, and goes to the fact that we all want our kids to be educated. But what's changing in our times and in the future is what being educated means and what a good education is. And I'm not going to go through all the things on this slide, but I encourage you, uh, we can, there are ways to download it and you can see it and look at it on your own. Uh, but the if you can see the very bottom of it, the new way of, of being educated and becoming educated is through doing real world impact projects. And this is what I observed as I looked at education around the world for the last several years, that at all levels, at elementary school levels, at middle and high school levels, at college levels, people were moving towards projects and not just PBL, project-based learning. That's there and people are doing it, but it's not really enough because it has no impact on anybody but the people doing it. Ah. I'm talking about projects that actually help people make a change in their world so that a kid at any level can point to that something and say, see that? Last year, that was not so good. This year, it's much better. I did it with my team. We made it better. And my sense is that if kids did that from the very beginning all the way through school, they had 18 years of this, and obviously, oh. there'll be collateral learning along the way. We, we want that. But if they really knew how to get things done, because they'd done it so many times, and they left school, not with a transcript of grades, but with a resume of all the projects that they and their team had accomplished and gotten done, then by the time they get to colleges and universities and, and especially businesses, which are now also becoming much more project-oriented, they would be in a much better position, no matter what happens in the world. So yeah. you can take this down, that's fine. Um, look at it at your leisure. I'm happy to give it to anybody. But that's... Um, that's the perspective that I come to, that the education, which used to be, we used for uh, only actually for the past several hundred years, uh, we used to think it was a very intellectual pursuit, that you learn and you get models and you do whatever, all the nice things that, that, that teachers want their kids to do. Right. Uh, teach, you know, I want to teach my kids how to think is an often heard uh, <laughs> phrase from college teachers. That is not unimportant, but it's narrow and limited in terms of what we need kids and people to be able to do. And so my view of this, and I'm curating this, I'm not inventing this because I see it happening in so many places. My view is that we're seeing an evolution to real world impact education. And that is just emerging, it's nascent. Uh, no country does it yet, no, no huge oh. district does it yet, but I try to encourage it. And I've been thinking about it, and I know one of your questions was gonna be how, which is everybody's question, and I have some thoughts on that. But I'm gonna be quiet for a little bit and let other people uh, come, to the, come to the table, or the stage, or you, and ask me questions, because I love that. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, and let me just tell everybody, especially if you're new here to the forum, that from now on, please ask a question. And you can, again, do that by clicking the raised hand button. Uh, you can do it by clicking the um, 
question mark or by typing it in chat. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you. I mean, I have a basket of questions all ready to go. Um, and let me just uh, quickly bring up uh, Tom Riley. Hello, Tom. Let's see if we can get him up here. And Tom and I just met um, at the beginning of this uh, at the beginning of this session, and I'm thrilled to meet you, Tom. I've got an email. I'll send you uh, some uh, links and so forth. But what you're describing, technical people call buy-in, and it is a structure in the brain, and it can be tricked by a very specific way. So the, the question is, have you ever heard of buy-in as a teachable management tool? Hmm. The, the, the real answer is no. I, although people have talked about buy-in for you can't get a project done with, you can't work with other people without it. So it's, it's one of those things that I've heard about all my life, not necessarily as a specific tool. The what I observe is that there's a ton of tools now for this kind of accomplishment and real world project that I'm talking about. Design thinking is one of those tools. Um, hackathons is another one of those tools. You're just describing yet another one of these tools. And these are all hugely important and I love them. But I don't want to send kids to school for 18 years to learn a tool set. I want the kids to learn the tool set as they go through the projects. And the difficult thing about this change in education is that most of our teachers have no idea of any of the elements of this tool set. They're used to delivering content. And since we now have technology to deliver content, we have no need for that anymore. And so it's very, we have a big transition to make in education, and I, you know, I can talk about how I think we have to make that. Uh, one key point: uh, buy-in can be used, but it must be used by invitation. If you push it on people, uh, it's just coercion. Uh, so there's a big ethical consideration in using tools that you need to use the tools in such a manner yes. that you invite the student to participate, mm. not beat them over the head with it. And oh, if, I can just, if I can just make a quick comment that just popped into my head and crazy Thanks. things do, who is the best in the world at getting, if I can put it into quotes, buy-in? The answer is Amazon. The answer is Amazon. They get yeah. us to buy everything. So essentially we're yeah. buying into all their products. So what, what that says to me, mm is that we have, often in the commercial world, developed huge tools to do kinds of things that we'd really like to get done, to do projects, to do buy-in, to do many of these things, and yet we don't think of those tools in terms of education. And I think we need to because that way we will help kids get the things done that realize their dreams. And that's the, you know, if, if school were really um, person oriented or student oriented or kid oriented, whatever they call that term these days, here's what would happen. You'd show up at school and they'd say, hi, Brian, tell me your dreams. Who are you? What do you want to do? I'm mm. your teacher. My job is just to help you do it. That's my only job, right? I don't need to teach you history or math or any of these things unless you need that to do what you need to do to recognize we don't do that. Nobody does that. So I think, but what's happened is that kids have changed. Because the world has changed, kids' capabilities and attitudes about what they think they can do and want mm. to do have mm. really morphed. And that's not just in the have places, but it's in the have not places as well. And as we allow kids and take a different view of kids that allows them to have impact and empowerment, they get excited by it. They want to do more of it. And the title of my next book, you saw seven books. I'm, I'm, it's really seven and a half now. Um, <laughs> the title of my next book is Our Kids Are Not Pets. Hmm. 
because mm. that's so often how we treat our kids. We tell them where to go and what to do and when to roll over and when to go to the bathroom. We test them to show their tricks. And that's not a good way to treat kids for the future if we really want the kind of world that solves all our problems. Well, Tom, thank you for those questions. Um, and uh, and Mark for that really, really rich answer. I like your inspiration about uh, buy-in, by the way. Let me, um, just by the way, that was a video question. It's that easy to do. Um, we also have a text question. So let me just bring this up right now from Jeff Ritter, who asks, great ideas, I agree completely. The rub is in the execution and the incumbent powers that be. Institutions are very stubborn. They only change when they have to. How soon do you think they will have to? That's a great question. And uh, the, the education system that we have now is like a human body. It loves homeostasis, right? Mm. We know all our cells from, from this year to next year are going to be different cells, but we're going to have the same body and the same in education. We might have different students and different principles, but the, the thing goes on. And there are huge antibodies to change. So what I concluded, what I've, the, the, what I've come to as a solution is the fact that we need two side-by-side -side systems. So if you are in a school, if you are an administrator, or even if you're at a country administrator, if you want to do this, you start a separate alongside program. Now, this is not hard to do. We do this for, we do this for uh, many kinds of kids, kids who are behind in credits, kids who have, have uh, learning problems, kids who have all this. We have these separate and parallel school systems. And so I've spoken to lots of administrators and they say, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a pain in the neck. I went to one for the kids who were, who were uh, in a particular place in my neighborhood. It was in a huge school of 5,000 kids and we were 200 kids who did something very different. Here's why that's such a good thing. First of all, they're models. So you high tech high is a huge model. They do this already. They've been doing it for 20 years. Um, and that, so we know how to do this. It's not like we can't do it. We have to make some adjustments, but not necessarily the people who are already teaching the normal way, the old way, they can't necessarily do it unless they make some changes. So we really want to have two side-by-side -side systems. But he, here's the, and here's the best piece of this. Right now, we have no way to compare. We have no way to say, oh, is this, you know, the old um, academic system with a little bit of PBL in it? And how do we compare that? To no, if we had two systems side by side, right. we could compare how the kids think, how the parents think, what the kids are doing, what they're learning. We could get new measurements and new, new metrics to teach them. So yeah. I hope and I'm encouraging this and I know it exists in many in, in some places. I won't say many but I'm definitely publishing this. And I've thought about, and what I've done is just started a, a new network. And I'm calling it, I'm still looking, searching for names, but I think it'll be called ARISE, which stands for Alternative Real World Impact Student Project for Empowerment. Okay, and you don't have to know all of that, but it's ARISE. So yeah. you can, so a parent can say, if this movement succeeds in some way, I don't want my kid to have an old ed academic education with the mess. The mess is math, English, science, social studies. I don't just want that. 18 years of classes. Uh, it'll, it might get them into college, but that's not necessarily uh, the goal. I'd rather they have an Arise education. I'd rather mm -hmm. they do projects, meaningful projects to them and to the world for 18 years. And so what I'm encouraging is a network of all the people in the world, and this is in many, many countries, doing this kind of Arise education. And so we can all learn from each other and we can, we can build these alternatives. And the best part is you don't have to get rid of the other one. If people really want right. the mess education, if people really want academic education for their kids, it's not going away, just like you said. But they're really, in my view, needs to be a viable, acceptable, uh, equally valid alternative way of becoming educated for the future. Having a rise in parallel. Yes, parallel, exactly. 
Um, friends, I have a few questions I want to uh, fling at Mark, but I uh, really want to encourage you to put forth your questions uh, as we go. So a few questions about uh, how Mark plans to do this or how this could work or how you would assess the different uh, ways of learning or how this appeals and applies to post-secondary education and so on. Again, just put up, press one of those buttons and give us your thoughts. We'd be glad to share them. Um, one question that occurs to me, uh, Mark, is uh, to think about how this differs between secondary and post-secondary education. I mean, what happens to colleges and universities uh, in this model? Do they also then have an ARISE-based undergraduate curriculum, for example, or do you see something different? Uh, no, I see that the, that these parallel things exist even in, at, the, at the college or university level, and many schools are doing this. Cogswell College, parts of uh, a Worcester Polytechnic are doing this, Ecole Calendue. Mm -hmm. um, the project-based schools are, are there, or some of them are, they're, they're emerging at the college and university level. One of the difficulties that they have is that if kids just come in at the college level to doing this for the first time, they're pretty hampered. They don't have any ah. experience doing this. So they have to really start. It's like going into a job. You come out of 18 or 20 years of education and you have yeah. no getting things done skills at all. So you start at the very bottom and have a brand new education in getting things done in the real world because nobody taught you that before. So I, again, Colleges and universities do very well if somebody has a very specific need that where they want to go in a particular direction and learn what's been mm -hmm. done up till that point and get prepared. Mm -hmm. That's fine. And I don't think that needs to go away. But I really see that this idea of doing projects at the college and university level really makes a difference. And it's not just me who sees this. There's a, there's a recent study from... Um, Gallup poll that got a lot of press that says if you want to succeed at a job, the three things you need to do in college, one of which is a long-term project. Right. And so the more of those people do and the better coaching they have in doing them, because it's not just automatic, the better coaching, the better they will be at it. And if they start in elementary school, like kids do, and you know, kids who go into the the um, robotics programs and other programs where they're doing this in elementary school, they have very advanced projects. By the time they're in junior high school, they're printing out prosthetic limbs and finding the kids who need the prosthetic limbs. And I encourage you, I have a database. It's at btwdatabase.org. If you want to put that up or somehow you can do that, okay. btwdatabase.org that lists a hundred of projects that kids have already done at all the levels. Wow. And so this is just for inspiration. If you know of any other projects, I'd love to add them. Uh, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening that there are schools and people thinking about this, individuals thinking about this, projects happening. And now I'm trying to pull it together into a network. I'll share that on Twitter in just a second. Um, we have uh, uh, another question here from uh, Cheng Hong, who has, let's see if I can bring this up. Um, hang on one second. There we go. Uh, she says, how could I start my kids thinking about a real world impact student project? How can I convince their teachers to encourage this kind of project? Oh, good. And we can bring uh, uh, Cheng Hong Shi up to, uh, to continue discussing this. Hello. It's a, it's a wonderful qu question. And I think it really is more encouraging your kid and vaguely trying to encourage the teachers. I write these books and I give them to all my kids' <laughs> teachers, but that doesn't change necessarily their behavior because the teachers are now incentivized to teach the curriculum and present content. And we, we all know that. Mm -hmm. But the way I would start with a kid is I would say, well, here's a database you can peruse. And that's something that some people want to do. But really, what are your dreams? And mm -hmm. what problems do you see in your life 
local mm -hmm. family world. It could be global warming, but it could be that people are fighting all around me, whatever it is that you with some of your strengths could solve. And could we put together a team of people like you to do this? And the problems that kids have already solved, if you look at the database, are amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read your list of the type of projects uh, um, in the in your document. Uh, it was amazing. I also think like uh, my son attends Boy Scouts, and when they um, complete Eagle when they achieve the Eagle Scout, they all have to complete uh, so many hours of service and uh, complete a project that serves a community, local community. Uh, do those kind of projects will come to meet your requirement as some type of, them of project? Do. I'm sorry to interrupt. Some yeah. of them do, some of them don't. And so okay. uh, sometimes uh, there are a lot of people doing projects and I, th I support that. Often they just come as a capstone at the end, like after you're an Eagle Scout or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to be much more continuous and frequent. The difference is, are they just raising money for something they care about? That A lot of these projects are, we went out and we raised a million dollars or X number of dollars for this. Well, that's not anything new. It's not anything we couldn't do before. It's not anything that takes advantage of the kids' new capabilities to, to be empowered in the world, except in a very minor way. So what I, what I, I have a metric. There is a metric and my metric is measurable positive impact on the world. Measurable positive impact on the world. This project, if it hadn't been done, there wouldn't have been this impact. And so, um, you know, I don't particularly see giving people money to do that. I see the people you give the money to perhaps as doing those mm -hmm. projects that make a measurable positive impact on the world. Mm -hmm. But okay, I, I, yeah. mm -hmm. kids want mm -hmm. to. Well, to me, like they seem very, um, at least at the Boy Scout troop that I'm seeing, maybe their structure is uh, structured it that way they motivate kids to complete these projects so that they can earn rank advancement that's kind of very um goal oriented and that they want to have rank advancement they do this and that it's not like i want to better myself i want to better the world and i do this so, so i really appreciate your approach and your pioneering work in this so. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Tung Ho. That was a good question. Um, you can see everybody that uh, people can bring up questions by text, by video, or both. Um, and um, I'm expecting that people aren't asking questions now because they're busy plotting with their families and their schools to apply exactly what you're talking about. Um, th let me ask another question while people are, are, are still working on this. Actually, whoop, some was faster than I was. Uh, here, let me just bring up uh, Clo uh, Castellanos. Here, let me bring this question up. How do you integrate a future mindset and skills in learning projects? Mainly because many people don't care about exponential technologies trends. Hey, Clo, let me know if you want to join us. If your camera works, that'd be great to follow up on this. Uh, that's a great question. And the one of the things that I observe, sometimes when I go into classes, I ask the kids, how many of you are scared about the future? And yeah. often I get a lot of hands and I think, Oh, that's strange because the future is so exciting. All these things are happening. And often I think it's because they pick that up from their teachers and other adults who having come from a different generation and are suddenly confronted by all this exponential change are very frightened. And, and so if we pass that along to our kids, I think we do them a great, great harm and disservice. Uh, and I, I, I look, I always look for analogies as to what, how can I say uh, this is going to happen like, yes. like something else. So you know, we can look at you can look at how fast Dubai say went from a fishing village to a world metropolis. Now that's not exponential growth. That's actually very fast linear growth, 
Right. But that was that was 50 years. That was 50 years. How fast did com, you know did the the uh, computers go from these huge desktop things to what we now carry in our pockets that are that are stronger? How quickly? And so I'm I'm always looking for ways where I can say what what actually happened um, exponentially. And I, I thought about a few, but I don't have them at the tip of my tongue now. But anybody who wants to contribute to that, that would be that would be fantastic to say. You know, this is not going to be like something you saw going from the Wright brothers to the supersonic jet in 50 years and now to more. It's going to be much much faster. The the price performance of like decoding the genome went yeah. in in just a few years from thousands of dollars to hundreds of dollars. And we're going to see these huge increases in power and performance and health and in in so many areas that we're going to uh, that our kids are going to experience and I really want them to be positive about this. Mm, and not have a uh, future shock. Um, let the me, kids uh, don't have that much future shock, but they have a little. They 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 worry about it because they're not being prepared for it. Mm. Because you know, you look at the future. You live in the future. My thirteen-year-old flies jet planes around the world. He's got a simulator on his on his desktop, and he flies seven eighty sevens and three eighties around the world after school. And, nice. and he does it with other people, and he's in touch with pilots, real pilots around the world. And then he goes to school, and he sits there, and he, he just hates it. It's just yeah. terrible. And the worst part is that there's no reason to be doing that, that we used to say we had to do it because uh, the world isn't going to change much, and the world will work really well if you know a lot about history or what happened or some of these skills. Almost all of those are moving to computers. And Tom said a very interesting thing earlier. He said, our greatest problem is climate change. And I think that's a huge problem. I agree. But I think a greatest problem for the next generation and for humans is integrating humans and machines, because mm. that's what's happening. Mm. We're becoming symbiotic. And so when, when the kids, you know, don't want to give up their cell phones, I see that as just evidence of their becoming symbiotic. I don't, and I certainly don't want to pull them back to the time when we weren't symbiotic. And I think that if you, if you look at uh, somewhere, I made a list here. Let's see if I have this things becoming machine skills, translating, reading and writing, research, conversation, relating, critical thinking, art and music. All of these are, are becoming not entirely, but they're becoming human machine skills. So if you're not a person who is comfortable thinking of yourself as part human, part machine, and how do we make this work in a really positive way for what we want to accomplish, then I think you're going to have problems. And that's, that goes way back to the digital immigrant, digital natives thing that I wrote it about does. 20 years ago. It does. Let's, um, there's a lot to chew on there. Um, and before I can pursue it, there are more questions that have come in from more people. Uh, this is one from uh, the awesome Mark Corbett Wilson. It's actually not too far from you. He uh, pushes the age up a little bit. Has Mark worked with adult self-directed lifetime learners? How does he suggest they document and demonstrate their learning? Mm, good question, Mark. Yes, that, no, that's a very useful question because I don't believe in lifelong learning as a goal. I think it's lifelong accomplishing should be the goal. And hmm. what we need to do, if we want to accomplish new things, we have to learn some stuff occasionally or frequently to do that. But the goal is not lifelong learning. We don't want to document the learning. We don't care about that. I don't care about that. Many people do. I care about the accomplishment. I care about what they can do, what the new, not even the new skills they have. I don't want to even document that. I want to document what they do with those skills and, and whatever it is that they've learned. And they can learn in so many ways, peer to peer. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's Dewey was almost there with learning by doing, but he had it backwards. Right. It's learning as a byproduct of doing, of accomplishing, not just doing anything, accomplishing something useful to you and to the world. That's, 
a really passionate answer. Uh, Mark, um, I wonder if this is going where you thought it was. Please, please follow up with another question if you, if you can. While he's doing that, uh, let me uh, bring in another uh, question that comes back to the mess, but this time from uh, higher education, and this time from a fantastic community college in Ohio. David Ron asks, so where does the study of history, philosophy, et cetera, fit into this model? I think about that a lot. And it's very interesting. The, the reason, one of the reasons the mess bothers me, the, the, that we teach kids math, English, science, social studies, or whatever, is that when you get to the college level or beyond, people are, are just hammering you with, well, nothing's stovepipe anymore, and nothing hmm. works in a particular discipline. Everything's cross-discipline. Everything, that was John Seeley Brown last week. And mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. so, but it's hard to understand that if you've started in kindergarten thinking that there are only four disciplines in the world. And when we ask a kid, what are you interested in? You know, what do you like? They don't say, I like whatever it is they like. They say the, the answer that's expected of them is math, English, science, or social oh. studies. Right. So the, the, the idea of the disciplines is, of course, important. But it's not necessarily equally important to everybody. And it's not equally important to everybody at every moment. So I'm at a time in my life when I actually am interested in learning more about philosophy and thinking about this. But when I was in college, no, I was, uh, in fact, I had a terrible course. Um, what I think what we do the worst job of, the worst job, and this is all through school, but I would, I would say it, it, it's very true in higher ed. We do the worst job of seeing the forest and not the trees, of cutting to the chase of what is really important. So I've often asked, and I did this with college teachers, if you had to take your course and tweet it, what was the one tweet that you'd want somebody to remember for the rest of their life about your wow. course? So I remember a, a biology teacher thinking about this and saying, okay, all things change, all living things change. And, you know, it's, you could look at this in one sense as reductionist, like the, you know, the whatever was the five minute university guy, uh, Father yeah. Guido Sarducci. Yes. But but the but in the other sense, it's very, it's very powerful because kids will go through huge courses and, and multiple courses, say in American history or stuff like that, and not know the very simple arc of what has happened or what is the key thing. So I've really thought about it. I don't know that I'll ever get to this in my lifetime. Reorganizing knowledge in a much more Ooh. fractal and pyramidal way and saying, okay, philosophy, here's Ooh. number one. This is the tweet. And now you want to go deeper? Here's a couple more. And here's a couple more. And let's go that way instead of linearly across. You know, we we don't, there's no reason we have to start with Socrates and Plato and move forward. We can you know, do the, we don't do that with almost anything else these days. Did you ever read that um, Herman Hesse novel, The Glass Bead Game? No, I didn't. Movie? Should it's I? A very, it's, yes, it's a very strange yep. book. It's not like the, it's not like the shorter ones, but it takes place in the near future after um, almost post-apocalyptic and civilization has rebuilt itself with a game. Um, the game is made of beads, thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of beads, and each bead represents some part of human heritage. So one bead could be the lyrical poem, one yeah. bead could be the benzene molecule. And you play the game by placing beads and having to argue for their connection. So everyone remembers all of civilization by putting these all out, and there's no hierarchical order to it. You just spread these out and make the connections between them. I will read it. It sounds very interesting. And well, because you brought that up, here's a very um, interesting perspective for, for the um, uh, higher education people. It used to be that books, like you just described, were just totally individual. Did you read this or didn't you read this? And if right. you hadn't told it to me, I might never have heard about it. And so the right. teacher's job was to connect the books connect the ideas mm -hmm. in the books. Oh, I'm a good teacher. Look at that. I can tell you Hess connects to this, connects to that. Now, mm -hmm. as soon as we get these, every book online, the machine can do that. So that even exists. There's a, there's a program from Google called Talking to Books. And right. 
right. you can type in a, a, a phrase and it will not just search for the, for, for the instances of that phrase, but it'll search for the meaning of that phrase. It'll read 150,000 books in half a second. And you right. should try it because it will really do things. And this is just the so very beginning of what AI yes. is going to do for us. So the real question that we need to think about is in this kind of an environment, what is the value that we add as humans? How do we collaborate? And, and you know, it's our body is, is very, um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, symbiotic. With the with the bacteria in our gut, right? right. There's, there's there's two separate organisms or millions of organisms in the case of the bacteria going on simultaneously. Neither one of which could live without the other. So, uh, but we've learned to make this adaptation, and that's I think that's what's going to happen to us with the kinds of technologies that we have now, and it's going to be silicone. very different. Quite a symbiosis. Um, I want to follow up on that, but, I, but there's two people here who have much better questions than I. Let me quickly bring up one from uh, Matthew Henry, uh, who asks, I can't say to the end, but the symbiotic thoughts are incredible. Dr. Jean Twang preaches correlation between smartphones and unhappiness. It seems that she doesn't want to be moved. You know, three things, apparently... Uh, and one of the great books, uh, you shared a book with me. I like, I like um, um, Will Durant's The Lessons of History. Yes, and, uh, that's a fascinating uh, book. The fact that we know the lessons of history and we don't have kids read that is, is just as bad as knowing the seven habits of highly effective people and not hmm. showing those to our kids. Um, hmm. But the, if you look at it like that, if you say this is the, the technology is really terrible and going to make us unhappy and going to do this, then you're just sticking yourself way back in the, in the past. And I wrote a piece once called time travel is punishment. Time yeah. travel is put away your devices, put away your, this, we are now effectively in the 18th century and you are being punished and do the things that we used to do in the 18th century. Happiness is, at least uh, I think Durant says this, it's a function of health and love mm -hmm. and then wealth. Those, are the, those seem to be the three things that matter to people over time in that order. So what can we do to increase health? We're doing a lot with technology. What can we do to increase love? We should do more with technology. We probably can. Kids are connecting, but we got to get better at it. And uh, then what can we do to increase the world's wealth so we're all better off? That's a huge combination. Um, do you think, uh, if, any, if anyone hasn't read this book, by the way, it's an incredibly thin, short book in which Durant wrote after he and Ariel Durant wrote this enormous history of, of everything. Um, it's, it's easy to find, very, very accessible. But uh, we have a question coming in from uh, Marcy Powell, and I bring her up on stage. Um, let's see if we can do this without, hello, Marcy. I think you're, you're muted right now. There you are. Hi, Marcy. Hello. Uh, so I've listened to everything you've said today, just incredibly interesting. And I'm wondering with this lifelong, rather than learning lifelong accomplishments and that, and making the world a better place, what kind of digital ecosystem or environment, and when everyone's talking blockchain and credentialing and and all of these things. So I'm wondering how does all this lifelong accomplishments play? What kind of digital ecosystem or what can institutions look at recreating, even if it's a parallel or on the side environment for this new environment you're thinking about? I, I think that's a wonderful question. And I think about that a lot when I see the billions of dollars that are going into um, what they call educational technology, and literally it's now, you know, seven, eight, ten billions of dollars, almost all of that is just going into the mess. It's going into the ways we used to do stuff. How can I do this more distance with more people? And if that same amount of money were going into some infrastructure for really helping people collaborate and do projects and understand where the issues and problems were. Here's just a, a, a one little suggestion. So I often thought about companies 
And a company, in any company, the chief technology officer, but it's probably every officer, has a list of things they want to do, he or she wants to do. And they probably have hundreds of things on that list, of which they will get to maybe 20, because they're limited in resources and time and all this kind of stuff. What if they had kids do the other ones? What if we just said, okay, these are out there. We really need somebody to do this and somebody to do this. And it could be competitive or it could be collaborative. Uh, in other words, we haven't connected the needs of, of adults and society mm -hmm. with the kids who now can help provide those needs. And, and one way to look at our kids is that they are the biggest unemployed group of problem solvers and doers in our world. I like it. That, that, that's a good one. So that ecosystem would be able to have a, almost like your BTW database, but where place these C-level executives could bring in their wish list and these students, K-12 or higher ed, could reach in and say, we can, we can take that on. Absolutely. And there might be a, an officer in every company whose job it is to go in the company, find those kinds of projects, give them, you know, to the kids. And, and it would do wonders for everybody. You know, think of all the, the nice things it would do for the kids to have said, I solved the problem of this particular company or this thing or that thing or my team did that. I like it. That would be uh, quite, a, quite a resume option but also quite a bit of self-confidence uh, for that person as they grow up. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the question, um, Marcy, thank you. Um, and I, I hate to say this, um, but we are at the edge of our hour. Mark, we have to, we have to wind up. Um, let me uh, first thank you so much for this rich and exciting vision of the future of learning. This is tremendous. Um, you, you mentioned a few ways that people can keep up with you by mentioning the database, for example, in your upcoming book. Is there a good central hub people should follow you at? Would be your Mark Prensky website? MarkPrensky.com. And Very that good. connects to MarkPrenskyArchive.com. And, and so I try to put everything that I, that I find, all the interviews, all the writings, all the videos. And, and this has been very inspiring. I was talking with Tara. I'm thinking of possibly doing is something with Shindig, you know, because you you have totally inspired me, Brian, um, to say this is a great way to reach people. And thank you, everybody who who uh, was interested enough to show up. And and I I look for ways. I might suggest that you prolong this by saying, is there a discussion forum that we can have for each of these sessions that would allow us to continue to ask questions and respond and stuff like that, and also to transcribe because I've had some of these mm. things and they mm. get transcribed yeah. and some people just really, it's easier for them and faster for them to look at the texts. Those so, but, but ideas. this for me is to be able to reach people and, and share my thoughts. And as I answer these questions, it inspires me to think more. And I love your wow. questions. Thank you. Because it really it helps me reflect on, on more and more aspects of what I'm trying to do. Uh, wow. But I hope you'll, I hope you'll, uh, this has helped you change some of your perspectives on education and that you'll think in, in ways that go beyond just incremental changes to what we already have. So uh, I think it has, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, and everyone stick around for a minute more because I need to uh, just mention what we'll be doing for the next week. So um, next, and thank you again, by the way, for such a great, rich variety of questions. Uh, I'm really pleased to see how uh, the conversation unfolded. And next week, we're going to dive back into an emerging technology. We're going to take a look at augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality for education. And we're going to be doing so with the guidance of the two best people on earth for those technologies in education, Maya Gorgieva and Emery Craig. Uh, they'll be talking with us and showing us where these technologies are going. Uh, they are wonderful people, great friends of the program, and I'm really, really looking forward to seeing them. Now, uh, I promise that we'll be picking out a book club title, and uh, we are about a, an inch from doing that. Um, and so when the poll goes up, we'll give you a chance to vote and figure out which nonfiction book we should be reading next. If you'd like to pick out some books for reading about the future of education and technology, 
head to our bookstore where we have a ton of titles, the only such curated title list in the world. And if you want to carry the conversation on further, as Mark suggested there at the end, we have a lot of ways of doing so. On Twitter, the hashtag FTTE has already seen today a lot of ideas and notes being tossed back and forth. You can follow me on Twitter. We have FTTE groups on Slack, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And you can find Shindig on all those platforms as well. So join us over the next week, and we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for coming. Bye-bye.